I remember when I when I started, I was really obsessed in in playing the notes. Of course, we all are, but that's all I could see myself as a successful bass player doing is playing the bass. And there are so many other ways to serve the bass community other than just playing your bass well. Well, playing your bass now is just the the minimum requirement. I had such a great time chatting with Patricia Weitzel for the podcast. She's somebody that I've wanted to have on the show for so long, and I'm so thrilled to bring you this interview with her. And if you're not familiar with Patricia, she teaches bass at Augustana College and St. Ambrose University, so not too far from where I used to live. She's also a member of the Sphinx Virtuosi, and she grew up in Brazil, did her undergrad in Brazil, and then came over to the United States, studied with Marcus Machado, former podcast guest at the University of Southern Mississippi, and Volkan Orhan, uh, sort of a former podcast guest, and we're going to do an in-depth with Volkan soon. And Volkan, of course, teaches at the University of Iowa. So there's so many great takeaways from this episode. We dig into competitions. We dig into what was unexpected about moving to the United States, Patricia's journey into the world of academia, why she always wanted to do this, and great stories along the way. You're also going to hear a lot of music from Patricia. We've got some excerpts from her wonderful YouTube channel, and check out the show notes for that. And you can check out patriciasilvaweitzel.com, and we have that all spelled out in the show notes for everything that she's up to. We've got some great sponsors for this episode. Also, we have the Chromatic End Pin, Emilio Guarino's very cool invention, creation, and we have D'Addario Strings and the Bass Violin Shop. We'll hear more from them later. Let's dig in and start, actually, with an excerpt of Patricia performing with her former professor, Volkan Orhan. of competitions as a a natural thing that happens in life so uh, it doesn't mean just because you got second place that you're worse than the first one it's just you you just didn't get that prize at that time but competitions actually promote uh, uh, growth Um, all these artists they had to practice a lot and and improve their um, performance skills and, and artist skills to get to that level I mean just to get selected to participate in that competition they're all winners i i would be really happy if i were selected to the to be a semi-finalist in this competition i would already consider myself um a winner uh competitions make you more creative it forces you to be more creative and um that's why we have some sucks for example um it's not uh, something bad. Uh, it teaches us, if you look at it with the right attitude, it's actually very positive because we all lose in things here and there and our losses actually turn into things that are positive. We all have had, I have a share of rejection letters and you know, fail auditions and at, at the end of the day, all of these things made me who I am today. And I'm very, very proud of where I am and hopefully where I'm going towards. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Yeah, I think it's something that, that artists can sometimes struggle with in terms of competition. Because if you look at sports or anything like that, like this Bradage competition was kind of like making the Olympics, right? So you're already at this <laughs> very high level. And then it's a snapshot in time, right? And I think that, I think that athletes ha- tend to have a little bit of a healthier outlook on that, that than, than musicians sometimes do. You know, because it's like, oh, I'm going to win this game, lose this game, win this game, lose this game. No one's expecting to win every single game. Yeah. And, and, and and it does have a lot of benefits. Like you were saying, it, it's great for bringing people together for a specific event, publicity for that event, pushing people forward, pushing. And I, I've done some competitions, not any recently, and I know you have as well uh, in the past too. Um, so I'm sure you've had that sort of experience of like kind of leveling up through that uh, training experience. Yeah, we've all been there, you know, and it's, it's not a bad thing. Of course, if you're competing... 
you're going to beat yourself up a little bit at the moment because you didn't get that prize. Uh, however, you became such a better artist just to, for going through that process. And honestly, there is always the next opportunity. I was thinking about that today just because I had an audition back in 2014 in Brazil, and I, I got a, a full-time position, that, which is what I always wanted. It was in my hometown, and I was, it was my chance to go back home and be close to family. It was very close to my uh, graduation date, so it was lined perfectly. I was, I was really thinking, oh, this is the job for me. Uh, but then I didn't, uh, the government got in crisis right afterwards. And we, they didn't have any money to hire anybody. And it's up to, the, up to nowadays, the position is there, but they never uh, really called any musicians that uh, passed that audition. But then, ha had I passed that audition and went back to, uh, had gone back to Brazil, I wouldn't have met my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the little things that uh, are in your, in your path that, it might seem like a big bump and, and you might not get what you want at the time, but there will likely have better things ahead. You just don't see it yet because we can't predict the future. But as long as you keep working and, and putting work on, on your goals, I think you, the opportunities will present themselves to you. Oh, I, compl I couldn't agree more. And I've, I have so many times in my life, if I look about it at my life now, I see those pivot points where something didn't work out, but then that, like, the reason why I'm together with my wife is because I didn't make it into the New World Symphony. I thought if it looked <laughs> exactly. like it was going to work out, it didn't happen well. I'm so glad I didn't make it into the New World <laughs> Symphony, right? We've been together 17 years now. I mean, it's, it's so, and I think even about professionally, some different opportunities that something did work out or didn't work out, and it, it, boils down to these moments and they just think like, wow, well, I, I guess I'm glad I played that note in tune because the next decade of my life, I ended up doing this or yeah. this thing didn't work out, but something great worked out. And it's just like continuing to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and moving on to the next opportunity. That's the, that's the thing I'm trying to continue to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you've done it uh, very well that the podcast and all this, the social media presence that you have for keeping us informed uh, of what is going on. It, it's really, really helpful. And it's a way to contribute to the base world. I remember when I, when I started, I was really obsessed in, in playing the notes, of course, we all are. But that's all I could see myself as a successful bass player doing is playing the bass. And there are so many other ways to serve the bass community other than just playing your bass well. But playing your bass now is just the, the minimum requirement, I guess. But that there's so many things that goes into being a musician nowadays. You, you got to go into marketing. You got to market yourself if you're a private uh, um, teacher um, or business. That's something that I didn't really think about. You know, go, how am I going to tell older people that I'm that awesome and they have to t study with me. We're not used to doing that as, as musicians, right? So uh, there are so many things you can do uh, and you should do than other than playing your bass and just reinvent yourself nowadays. So there are other ways to serve. You don't have to only be worried about playing those notes. But do practice though, keep practicing. <laughs> strategies you use? I mean, maybe competitions. What, what else do you do to try to motivate students to kind of get to that next level, get that fire going in them? Yeah, I actually, um, talking about competitions, I do make some mock auditions. 
towards the end uh, just to get them to really uh, understand how the system works. But in the process of leading to the mock auditions, we do a lot of focus on different parts of the excerpts, not just a playing repetition, but the exercises that will make the transitions between, uh, for example, sixteenths and, and the eight notes, triplets, because they have a hard time doing that. We actually put the bass down and we do a lot of subdivision just to internalize it because they, if they don't know it, they won't be able to actually play it on the bass, right? That's the, the struggle that I, I find with these students is they just want to play it. And I've been there. <laughs> you just want to play the bass. You don't want to understand uh, exactly how things are structured. But a, a lot of the, the, the study that I do with them is without the bass, just to understanding how the, the rhythmic phrase is written. And then when, once we go to the bass, I do a lot of work with dynamics, not necessarily with the excerpt, but just they can understand the structure and how the mechanics of doing loud dynamics and soft dynamics and changing from one to the other very, very fast because that's one of the, the features of the excerpt. So we can do it even with long notes and then um, do it with half notes and then quarter notes and then uh, groups of sixteenths and so forth. So they understand the mechanics of things. And then we go to the excerpt. So I don't, I don't always start with the excerpt because that can be quite scary. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so I start with elements that are covered in the excerpt and then I slowly introduce the excerpt. Next up, we dig into Patricia's whole journey moving from Brazil to the United States, what that experience was like ending up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi after doing your undergrad in Brazil, growing up in Brazil, what all that was like. Fascinating conversation. Before we do that, I'd like to give a shout out to the Chromatic Pin and Emilio Gorino. Emilio, former podcast guest, has come up with this very cool invention. You can learn more about it at thechromaticnpin.com. And if you go there, you'll see a video that I shot experimenting with a chromatic end pen. I've been using it and I've been loving it. It's actually my first experiment with an angled end pen. And it's fascinating how the weight shifts. For me, I've been standing these last few years and just the way that the weight shifts in my overall posture, I don't know how to describe it. I should come with better words for this, but I found it, it just proves this sort of lightness and balance that's just different than when I play with a straight end pen. I'm not the only one who's been having that experience. Lots of people have, and you can read more about people's experiences and order one of your own at the chromatic end pen. Dot com. I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop. They do professional setups, repairs, and restorations at reasonable prices. They specialize in resetting necks, repairing cracks, installing new fingerboards, new bass bars, custom C extensions, whatever your playing needs. The Bass Violin Shop will work hard to get the most out of your instrument without blowing your budget. Check them out at BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to our conversation with Patricia about the whole experience of moving from Brazil to the United States. Was University of Southern Mississippi the first place you went to when you were in the United States? Is that where you started studying? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Actually, uh, I went there for my master's because I did my bachelor's at the uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais with Fausto Boring. Uh, but he was the one uh, that actually uh, encouraged me to study abroad. As after, after I graduated, I actually got a full-time job, uh, and I was going to take it, but he, he said, Patricia, I really think you should keep studying and exploring your possibilities. Why don't you consider studying abroad? And I just thought he was crazy, just because I, I didn't know any uh, foreign language. I didn't know any other language other than, than um, Portuguese, and I thought studying abroad was 
something that virtuosi double basses would do and and with my background and and I was just not on board with that but he really insisted uh, with that idea so much so that he actually compiled a list of teachers and said okay here it is contact these people and I and I said I don't know any English or anything how do you do so he wrote me a template and I sent emails to to everybody and among of these people it was uh, Marcos Machado in conversing with him, I explained to him, you know, I, I don't have the language, unfortunately. And then he said, well, there is a program here at the University of Southern Mississippi in which um, international students can come for a year and learn the language, and then they will enter the program afterwards. So that's what I did, and that's how I ended up in, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, studying with Marcos Machado. What was it like landing in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, not speaking English, and like what? Just what were those first few months like for you? Well, uh, uh, that was quite a, a surprise for me. I don't think I quite prepared myself to come to the U.S. I was just really excited to go abroad, but I didn't do my homework as to where I was going to, what what the, the city was like, what life was like. So uh, coming from Brazil, which is a very large country, just like the United States, I, I shouldn't be surprised at this, but it's impossible to geographically define the United States with a single term, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And, uh, and that can come as a surprise to international students uh, who haven't researched the area that they will soon be calling home. So in my case, I, I'm from Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, but I was living from, uh, in Belo Horizonte, which is a city with over 2 million people. And then I moved to live in Hattiesburg with a city with the population of roughly 45, 50,000 people. So I loved my time at USM, but its remote setting made for an initial adjustment for me, um, which was a lot better once I found friends with cars. <laughs> <laughs> who could you know drive me to the grocery store, for example? But it was it was very uh, interesting time, but also very rewarding because uh, living in a small town has its perks. Um, I live close to school, very close to school. The cost of living was minimal. I didn't know that at the time. For me, it was very expensive. But now I say it's uh, the cost was minimal, and the distractions were literally none. Uh, since there weren't too many things going on around me, I, I really could just focus in school. And, and it was the time that I did the most practicing my entire life. What, what was it like uh, technically? Like, did, were you going through those sort of materials with Marcos? Uh, how, how, did, how did that just studying the bass shift for you when, you when you landed at Hattiesburg and started working with Marcos? Oh, Marcos definitely uh, fixed a lot of my mechanics. So how to play the bass, uh, how to produce the best sound, how to look and decide for the best fingerings and, and bowings. Um, because at that time, I was just following what was given to me. I never really thought about the process of actually finding fingerings and bowings up to them. And, and, and he was really uh, helpful with that. So he helped me develop a concept of sound that I, I should strive for. Uh, look for beautiful tone, uh, resonant, um, clear. But uh, Marcos, he's a very uh, blunt guy. So he, uh, I wasn't ready for that at that time. And that's actually a funny story. In one of our lessons, he told me just straight up, Patricia, this is not in tune. Try again. And I tried again. It wasn't in tune. It wasn't in tune. And he would just really say it all the time. It wasn't in tune. And I, was, I kept getting frustrated. First, so frustrated that by the time the lesson ended, I had tears in my eyes. But I, I didn't drop them. They were there. I didn't <laughs> drop them. But as soon as I left the office, I just cried and cried and cried and cried so much. But we had a studio class right afterwards. And I didn't want him to see that I had cried so much. So I got my sunglasses and I put on sunglasses and I go 
to studio class with sunglasses and he's wondering why are you wearing sunglasses i said no it's it's just bright here but there's no windows <laughs> <laughs> And I, uh, throughout the entire day, because I cried so much, my eyes were swollen. I, I kept wearing those sunglasses in school the entire day. And, and he, after that, uh, like uh, this next day, I think he heard about it. And then he, he talked to me and said, Patricia, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm saying things that is too, you know, in a way that is too rough, just let me know. I can tame it. And I said, no, it's okay. Because so, he, he got worried. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it's just so helpful to actually listen to things directly. I wasn't ready at the time, but it was a, 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 it's something that I do with my students nowadays. Instead of going around and, and playing with words, I actually tell them the way it is. And I've found that I, I get better results this way because we go straight to the point and they know exactly what they need to do to fix things. All right, tell them. <laughs> we also talk about the Sphinx organization, what it is and what it's done for Patricia's career. The Sphinx organization is a Detroit-based national organization that is it's dedicated to transform lives through the power of diversity in the arts. Um, it was founded by Aaron Dworkin, who was a young, young black violinist, and he was extremely aware of the lack of diversity both on stage and in the audience, in concert halls. Uh, I think at the time that he started Sphinx, less than 2% of the musicians in professional orchestras were either black or Latino musicians. So he founded Sphinx when he was an undergrad at the University of Michigan to address the stark underrepresentation of people of color in classical music. And the, pro the organization has several programs, but I think the most popular is the Sphinx competition that happens every year in February. And I was a semi-finalist in the competition uh, I didn't win, talking about failure, there you go. But that doesn't mean I lost by any means because my career has been positively affected by Sphinx and the, my relationship with Sphinx in so many ways because not only the artistic excellence is great, but the motivation aspect is what gets me every time I go there. There is like a, a potent and wonderful feeling that I feel that is created when you spot something that shows you the world's possibilities and consequently your own, right? So when you see someone that looks like you uh, doing something that you, you think it's great, it inspires to be just as great. Uh, and that's what has happened uh, with me and Sphinx. So when I participated in the competition in February, I didn't win, but they had uh, several uh, um, opportunities related to being a semifinalist. So I could apply for music festivals. Uh, they had scholarships for music festivals. They had an instrument fund. And I was part of that's when I started being a part of the Sphinx Orchestra, Chamber Orchestra, that now is the Sphinx Virtuosi. The, what is that part of the Sphinx organization exactly, the Virtuosi? Yeah, it's a traveling uh, ensemble. We, we meet every uh, fall uh, for five weeks, and it's comprised of 18 Sphinx alumni. So uh, all members have been part of the competition at some point. And we travel. We, we've, this year we're going to play at Carnegie Hall. We're going to play at New World Symphony. So really... Uh, beautiful venues and it's mostly playing um, works by black or Latino composers. Patricia has been on this journey into the world of academia. It's what she's wanted to do basically her whole adult life. We dig into that and some fabulous stories along the way with people like Volkan Orhan. You'll love hearing all of this from Patricia. And I'd like to give a shout out to our final sponsor. That is D'Addario Strings. And I have this message from Kate Jones, who I just had on the podcast last week. Kate Jones teaches bass. She teaches a Suzuki bass down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And she has been loving D'Addario's 
fractional size strings. That's strings for tenth size basses and smaller. And here's what Kate has to say about D'Addario's fractional strings. Recently, I've had the opportunity to try out D'Addario's new one tenth slash one sixteenth crossover size string for fractional basses. Um, the things that I love about this string is that it's got a beautiful tone and for tiny humans the strings have to be easy to push down which um, these strings are and also they're easy to bow for them um, you don't have to use a lot of arm weight so overall I think this has been a really exciting string for my studio learn more about what Diderio is up to at ContraBaseConversations.com slash strings and thank you for sponsoring the podcast all right back to our conversation with Patricia I always wanted to go into higher education um, and college teaching in Brazil it's you have a better shot at it if you have a, a doctoral degree so uh, after I was done with uh, my master's in Hattiesburg, I applied for a couple of schools, but I always had University of Iowa in the back of my mind because Fausto studied at the University of Iowa. I actually tried to come here first, but they don't, didn't have a, such a program as uh, the University of Southern Mississippi with the English language. But I knew uh, in the back of my mind, I really wanted to come to the University of Iowa. So when I, I finished my master's, I decided to, to come here. It was a big problem, though. I couldn't afford it. No. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. Like, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the scholarships were a little more limited because I was an international student at the time. But Volcan mentioned there was a fellowship program that is only like one or two for the, the School of Music, but it's, it's with the most qualified candidates and it's very hard to get. Uh, but he said, oh, I think, I think you have a shot at it. Just send additional materials uh, and we'll see how it goes. And then luckily I, I got it and that's how I end up in Iowa. But then I didn't do my research again. I was lucky because Vulcan is one of the most amazing teachers that I, I could have uh, ever had anybody that comes in contact with Vol Vulcan is, is lucky um, although I wasn't a good student myself and I made him go through all kinds of troubles oh no <laughs> yeah I'm surprised he still talks to me nowadays <laughs> and I often joke like the day I left the universe was his graduation day <laughs> <laughs> not mine but Vulcan is the best example of what I call a well-rounded mentor uh, I remember at the beginning of my career uh, like I mentioned before, all I wanted to do was play the bass. And he showed me that there were other things besides playing the bass, especially if you're looking for a career as a university professor. Uh, and the best part of all is that he didn't tell me any of these things. He just taught me by example because he did all these things. So he was always on time. He replies to emails in a timely manner. He recorded every lesson and uploaded the recordings on a university database. So you could always go back and listen to the lessons and refresh your memory on what he wanted uh, you to do and what the content was covered. His lessons are very well organized and, and extremely effective because he divides the time between technical work and repertoire really well. So I, I never really felt overwhelmed um, with the amount of work that he, he gave me. and. He taught me how to recruit, how to be professional, how to deal with adversity. He's just an amazing advisor, very supportive of the students in his studio, and, and just one of the best bass players out there. So I, I was very lucky to, to study with him. But uh, we have a couple of funny stories with him, too. There's two things that happened um, <laughs> when I was at the University of Iowa. Yeah, he lets you play. When you come in, you play, and then he always highlights the positive aspects of your playing first. So he says, oh, I, I like what you did in this measure. I think you really kept the phrase really well here. But a couple of things. And then he starts shredding it. It's like, oh, <laughs> this wasn't good. You can improve this and blah, blah, blah. And that goes on and on and on. And he would always do that. And then one day I just wasn't in the mood for the – the nice part first 
<laughs> so I played and I was like, just go to a couple of things. <laughs> and uh, every time that he meets me, uh, we, we talk about things it's like a ah, couple of things, couple <laughs> of things. And Vulcan was the one uh, who actually inspired me to play Bach on bass. But it was a hard path, I guess, <laughs> to that, <laughs> to that uh, just because uh, he made me play the third suite in a recital and I told him I wasn't ready. And I had, and in fact, I did, I, I think I was ready, but I just wasn't confident in myself enough to think that I was ready, but uh, he was right. I was ready, but in my mind, I wasn't. So, uh, I kept telling myself I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. And I told him, I don't feel comfortable performing this in public. It's Bach after <laughs> all. Uh, but he, he actually said, no, you have to, to play it. It, all of it with repeats <laughs> <laughs> and then I, everything went well until I got to the jig the last move I had a memory sleep so and I was playing my memory so when you have a memory sleep it's, it's hard to recover you and even if it's sort of split second for you it, it it feels like it was the entire performance was terrible. And, and that was right before intermission. So I recovered from it. I played and then I went backstage and he came um, backstage and he said, hey, congratulations. It sound good. And, but I was so mad. Oh, my God, Jason. I just call, I called him the most terrible names <laughs> i didn't want to see vulcan for a long time and it got so bad after that i hated bach i hated bach for so long and and he always joked with me oh i i hope you you can reconnect with bach at some point <laughs> and I, I i finally did i finally did but that moment i remember that moment being so angry and he he was such a nice guy about it he, he just let me vent <laughs> <laughs> and he's just such a good person. But students out there, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> How did Bach become your friend again? Did it just happen one day or did, was it a certain movement? Actually, just... <laughs> it, was, it was recently because my husband, he, he really likes Bach. And uh, I was playing with the Des Moines Symphony. Uh, there was one cellist that came uh, to play a uh, concerto. But then the encore, he played. Uh, the first movement of the the prelude of Bach Suite one. <laughs> okay. And then my husband after the concert was like, "Oh, I like that so much. Can you play it?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and said, "I know you can play it because I also play cello, right?" So, uh, uh, so he was like, "Yeah, I think I've heard you play once or twice." And I said, "Yeah, but that was on cello. That's uh, a, a lot more idiomatic. On the bass, a little harder." And, and he said, no, I think you should play on the bass. It will be pretty, just, just play a couple of measures for me. And then I, I played for him a couple of measures, but then I kept going and I kept going and I kept going and he kept smiling. And then I, <laughs> by the end, he was like, oh, that sounds really good. And that, that time I was like, okay, let me try the, the, the other movements then. And, and I started playing it at home just for him. And finally, uh, it just got to me. This is not as, as, series of a deal as I thought. I just had a memory of sleep a long time ago, right? Uh, I could still enjoy the music. It's amazing what the, the tricks we play with our mind and associate things with bad moments you've had in your but that is nothing to do with the music. It's just <laughs> what you you associate with with. Was cello your first instrument and then you came to bass? How did or was did you pick that up later in life? How did that work? Oh, yeah, much later in life. Um, cello uh, was my minor at the University of Iowa because as a doctoral student, you need to choose a secondary area to focus on. And I was always really curious about cello just because at the time I was thinking about turning my bass in fifths. So I thought, you know, if I can um, play the cello a little bit, maybe I can have a sense of how things would work on the bass later on. But I, then I kept studying it and, and got a minor in, in cello. And I, I had a lot of fun, I must be honest, because, again, the Bach <laughs> cello suite, it's just like plays so much easier on the instrument. And it, it's great. And it's a beautiful instrument, but my, my heart is set on, on, on the bass. I just love those low notes. 
Um, and yeah, when I got an extension, oh my God, that was the <laughs> happiest day of my life. <laughs> Did and I always think it's interesting when you pick up another instrument, like what it does to your your main instrument. Did did working on the cello and just like the different shape and the different posture and the different bowing and the different tuning did that change the way you approach bass at all? It actually uh, helped me a lot with my my bass playing, just because to having that feeling of being relaxed. I'm a, um, I don't know if you remember, but I'm very short double basses. Uh, I'm only five feet tall. So it's, it was always a struggle to find a position that I could actually feel comfortable playing the bass. For the longest time in my career, I couldn't um, play the bass for long periods of time without experiencing some pain. Not anything extreme, but um, I would feel pain. And of course, that's not a, something you would uh, like to experience. Um, and I think that the, I, I, having that sense, uh, that feeling of what I could feel when I played an instrument just proved to me it's possible. So it's not something wrong with my body. I just really need to find an instrument that is um, better and more suitable to my body. And, and it finally happened two years ago, actually. Um, I got a grant from the Empower Sphinx artists. Um, and I finally could buy a Nick Lloyd bass, which is very, very wonderful. The, the string length of that thing is perfect for my hands. I don't have to stretch so much to get all the, the intervals. It's very comfortable to play. Uh, also nice to travel with, with the, the removable neck feature. Um, so that, that has totally changed my life. Uh, and now I practice pain-free, <laughs> which is great. How old were you when you came to University of Southern Mississippi? Were you 22? Uh, 22, 22. Okay. So if you could go back to 22-year-old Patricia and give her some advice, what might that oh. be? Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think I would tell myself to just be more confident mm. and that everything works, everything's going to be okay at the end. And I, it might not be a straight path, but uh, there will be bumps and, and lumps here and there. But as long as you keep your artistry and your music in first place, you will be taken care of. And that's something that I, I always worried about when I was a student, my 21, 22 years old uh, self. Uh, I would worry too much about the future, uh, so much that I, I wouldn't enjoy the present. It turned out that I, I wasn't present and I wasn't doing things that I could have done or enjoyed at the time. So be present, uh, do the job, do the work, put, put on the work and you, you'll be fine. Patricia, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out everything she's up to, and she is at the start of a great career. She's doing so much, and it'll be so fun to see what she does five years from now, ten years from now. I just can't wait. Patricia Silva Weitzel.com. And again, that is spelled out. If you're not good with vowels and consonants and the order of them, you can check out the show notes and everything she's up to there. And thank you for listening. I am so grateful that you're on this journey with me. I'm having so much fun and learning so much in this do-it-yourself doctorate or whatever the heck it is I am doing with these hundreds and hundreds of interviews. I'm having a great time connecting the base community, and I love hearing from people from all over the world. I hear from so many different people. I've gotten messages from South Africa, from Japan, from Indonesia, from Canada, from Australia, from Argentina, from places way more off the beaten path than even those. And I would love to hear from you. Whether you've written me before, this is your first time, feedback at ContrabasseConversations.com will put you in touch with me. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me what you like about the show. Tell me what you'd like to hear more of on the show. That would be great. And of course, you can find us at Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram, all the usual suspects. We're out there. YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a bunch of stuff up there, including a whole bunch of George Vance videos I just shot, by the way. Books one and two of George Vance, teaching materials I use. You can check those out. All those links are available at ContrabasseConversations.com. Thank you so much for following along, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.